Good morning, everybody. It is lovely to be back with you this Sunday morning after our latest cycling adventure. Raish and I have had a wonderful time, but I have to say that one of the best things about going away is coming back home to our families, not only at home, but also here at St. Paul's. When Raish and I decided to take on this latest challenge, we knew we were in a race, a race to be fit and a race to lose weight because we were taking on the mighty Bialak Nabar, which was no small undertaking. So when I was thinking about passages to preach on this morning, it was the first three verses of our reading this morning that Matt read out earlier that came to mind. So let's remind ourselves of those three verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honour beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. A powerful passage, you must agree, and one that gives us some invaluable pointers on how to successfully navigate the Christian walk of faith, which we all know isn't always easy. In this passage, the writer, who many believe is the Apostle Paul, refers to the Christian walk as a race. So join me as we delve deeper into these three little verses and how we can incorporate these truths into our own lives. For the next few minutes, I would like to share four points with you, which I hope will prove helpful to you. The first of my points this morning is this. Remember and be inspired by those who have gone before. The first piece of advice is to remember that you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and that you can be inspired by those who have gone before. The very first word of our passage this morning is the word therefore, which connects it to the previous chapter. In chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews gives us a long list of people who have been found faithful. For instance, in verse 7, he mentions Noah. How many of us here this morning are impatient? I know I am, especially if I am trying to learn something like a musical instrument. I want to be able to just pick, it up, pick up a guitar and to be able to play like Eric Clapton. When that doesn't happen, unsurprisingly, I will start muttering to myself, why can't I do this? Why is it taking so long? Or perhaps you have been praying for something that is important to you, but feel that nothing is happening and you are starting to feel discouraged. Maybe if we thought about Noah and imagine him whispering in our ear, saying something like, how long do you say you've been waiting? It took me a hundred years to build the ark, and it was never easy. I tried to warn the people, but no one would listen. Yet, I kept on building, and when the floods came, the ark was the vehicle of our salvation. You need to persevere and keep going. Next, in verse 8, he mentions Abraham, called by God to leave the safety of his home. Abraham who in his old age was told that his wife Sarah would bear a son, Abraham, who was told to take this precious son and offer him as a sacrifice. It wasn't easy, but Abraham passed every test. So when you become discouraged, imagine Abraham whispering in your ear, listen, he says, if you obey God, the world will think you're crazy because God's ways are not their ways. But listen carefully and be true to his will. Then, 
jump to verse 22 and the story of Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. In Egypt, he was accused of crimes he didn't commit and was thrown into prison. He was about as low as a person can get, yet he remained faithful to God. Then everything changes, and suddenly he is very powerful, prime minister of Egypt. He has control of money, grain, food, and people, and yet, when he is at the top, he is still faithful to God. So listen to what Joseph might say to you. Look, it doesn't take too much to be faithful when things are going your way, but when you are at the bottom and everything seems to be falling apart, make sure that you are still faithful. The list goes on. There is Moses, Samuel, Samson, David, and many more besides. There is a great cloud of witnesses to cheer us on. They whisper in our ear when we become discouraged, saying, don't lose heart, don't give up, don't quit, whatever you do. So when I get discouraged, I think not only of the great saints in scripture, but also of others who have inspired me in my life. I think of my parents who have faithfully followed the Lord practically their whole lives and who are still sharing the gospel to this day. To the people here in this church who were instrumental in myself coming to know the Lord. I think of one of my heroes, Eric Liddell, who was so strong in his faith that he refused to run the heats of the 100 meters in the Olympics because they were on a Sunday, meaning that he would miss out on the opportunity of an Olympic medal in his strongest event, who in his peak years fulfilled the promise he made to God by going out to the mission fields in China, which ultimately cost him his life. There's a story of a football coach who had a player who was known for two things. The first thing he was noted for was his faithfulness at football practice. He was the first one out and the last one to leave, but he could never quite make the team. He just wasn't good enough. The second thing he was known for was that his father often visited him and they would be seen walking arm in arm across campus, very much engrossed in conversation. Everyone noticed that and thought it was wonderful. Well, one day the coach got a note to say that the boy's father had died. The coach was the one chosen to break the sad news to the boy and so he called him in and told him. The boy was understandably greatly shaken and had to go home for the funeral. But he was present at the next game, sitting in his customary place on the bench. Then he came over to the coach and said, Coach, this is my fourth and final year and I've never played in a game. I'm wondering if today you could put me in for just a few minutes and let me play. So as the boy had recently lost his father, the coach put him in. To the coach's amazement, the boy played an absolute blinder, taking the game by the scruff of the neck and playing so well that the coach left him on the field. When the match was over, the coach called the boy over and said to him, listen, I've never seen anyone play like you played today, but up to today, you were the worst football player I had ever seen. I want an explanation. And the boy said, well, coach, you see, my dad was blind and this is the first day that he ever saw me play football. So be inspired by those who have gone before and realize that at the same time there will be others watching you. You will be their inspiration, their example and their guide. My second piece of advice this morning is to let go of the weights that hold you back. In that moment of madness when Raish and I decided to take on the Bialak and the bar in January, we both knew what we had to do. We had to get fit, that's a given, but we also had to lose some weight, some more than others. I'm talking about me there, Raish, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when taking on something as demanding as the Bialak, Weight is an important issue to address. Not only our personal weight, but also trying to cut down weight on the bike. 
because every extra pound of weight you are carrying can make a huge difference when climbing. Take, for example, the 100 metres in the Olympics. The athletes all come out on the track in tracksuits, but before the race starts, they have stripped down to lightweight running shoes and skin-tight lycra to be as light and as streamlined as possible. The athlete knows he or she is never going to win the race running in welly boots. In the second half of verse 1, the writer, says, the writer of Hebrews says this, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We cannot expect to finish the race if we are burdened down with weight, especially our sins. In our series on the Pilgrim's Progress, we see our main character, Christian, struggling with the heavy burdens on his back and how desperate he is to be free of them on his way to the celestial city. The writer mentions two things that we should lay aside because they hinder us. The first one is sin. Sin hinders, hinders us from full participation in the Christian life. To use a metaphor, it is like getting dirt and smudge in your car's carburettor. Dirt and debris can get into a carburettor and pollute the fuel, causing the pistons to misfire, which in turn makes the car run at a lower efficiency. And if enough dirt and gunk gets into it, eventually it will cause your car to completely shut down because a car can't run on dirty fuel. There is only one way to get it back into good operating order, and that's to get some carburetor cleaner and clean the gunk out. Willful, unconfessed sin hinders your progress in your walk with Christ. It will slow you down, it will pollute you, and it will eventually cause you to experience a complete spiritual breakdown if you don't clean it out by confessing it to God and forsaking it. But notice that the writer also says we should strip off every weight that slows us down. Weights are things that are not necessarily sin in and of themselves, but can pull you down and slow you down in the Christian life. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. There are some things in life that are not inherently wrong, but can be wrong for you because they pull you down in the Christian life. Now, I love table tennis. I have loved table tennis ever since I was a teenager and have actively played in table tennis leagues for a large percentage of my life. I love the competit competitiveness of a league match and I absolutely hate losing. If you ask anyone in my family, they will tell you how competitive I am. But I also know that I have to be careful that I don't let it take over my life to the point that it is detrimental to other parts of my life, my family, my church life. Table tennis isn't a sin. Wanting to do well isn't a sin, but it can be a weight if I'm not careful. So with God's help, I try and get some balance in my life. I don't need to practice table tennis every night of the week, and I try to enjoy it for what it is, a game unless I'm playing these two, then, then it's serious. I wonder if there's something in your life that is not a sin in itself, but it's become a weight in your life. Or to use Paul's terminology, it's not beneficial or it has too much control of your life or your affections or your time so that you neglect more important things. We see it all the time in the media. How many times have the papers or news been taken up by celebrity marriages breaking up because they've been so focused on successful careers in the movie or music industry that they have lost focus on what is important, the sanctity of their marriage? These are the kind of weights that we are being warned about. So let go of what is holding you back. 
My third point is this. Be prepared for the effort required. Another key verb in this passage is run. Notice again in verse 1, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The word run implies effort. I have to admit, I am not a fan of the word effort. You know, this may come as a surprise, but I don't particularly enjoy cycling up hills, especially if it's against a strong wind or driving rain, which we experienced both up in Scotland. However, I love that feeling when you reach the summit, that sense of achievement, and often the reward of an amazing view. In our case, there wasn't a view because it was thick fog. The reason I dreaded it before and during the workout is that like any kind of athletic activity, they require a tremendous expenditure of effort. And can I be honest with you this morning? Living the Christian life is not a bed of roses. It's not all fun and games. Doing right instead of what is comfortable is hard. Once Christ becomes your saviour and you follow him, you have the capacity to run the race effectively. But you also have that old sin nature still working against you. And it takes effort to serve God and to do right and to stay focused on Christ and to live for him. I pray this morning that God will help you to work at living for Christ, to put in the efforts to make whatever sacrifice you must make do to write and please God. The next important phrase in this passage is the race. This little phrase implies struggle. Friends, we are in a constant battle, a fight to the death with the forces of evil. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Because we are in such a struggle, we must be prepared for it. How did Raish and I get ready for the BELAC? We exercised, we practiced, we worked out. You discipline and regiment your daily life, making sure you eat a proper diet, get enough fluids and get enough rest. You do all of this so that you are physically and mentally at your best at the start. We need that same commitment, that same discipline to run the Christian race. You need a proper diet of the word of God to feed your soul and strengthen you spiritually to run the race God has set for you. You need a disciplined regimen of Bible study, prayer, church attendance, you need to be daily filled with the Holy Spirit, the water of life. Living for Christ is not a cakewalk. It's a race. It's a battle. It involves our every effort. The final phrase I want to look at in this verse is with patience. You know, when I was working at my last job and I was working long, tiring hours, I really was quite miserable. I was praying and asking God for something better and applying for other jobs in the area. But all the jobs that I applied for or had interviews for, a compromise had to be made. Further to travel, a drop in income, shift work, weekend work. On two occasions I was shortlisted but fell at the final hurdle and I was starting to get quite impatient. And I'm going to let you into another little secret. I have a special lay-by. When I feel that life is getting on top of me or feel that God isn't hearing me, I pull into this lay-by and have a frank and honest discussion with God. At the start of May this year, I was getting tired, I was getting fed up and I was getting frustrated. The thought of another year of getting up early and working long hours was making me quite depressed and I was becoming quite desperate. So on the way home, I pulled into my special lay-by and with tears in my eyes, poured out my frustrations to God. I said, Lord, I am at the end of my tether. I can't go on like this and I can't understand why you aren't hearing my prayers. But if your will is for me to be a witness for you at Bell Brothers Nurseries, 
then so be it. But I need your help and your strength to get me through. Quite a desperate prayer. Within two days of that prayer, someone I used to work for when I was a young man walked into Kate, who's my wife's work, to pick up some glasses and whilst there asked Kate if I was happy in my work and if not, to give him a ring. Within a week of that prayer, I was offered a new job with no compromises, but actually more beneficial. What I learned was that God knows what he is doing and all he asks from us is a little patience and to trust in him. So after realizing the effort required, my final point this morning is this, fix your eyes upon Jesus. One of the most important lessons a sprinter learns is to focus on the finish line, blank out every other distraction and visualize crossing the finishing line. Did anyone here watch the men's 100 meters final at the Rio Olympics? Justin Gatlin, the American sprinter, was the man in form. Usain Bolt was having a poor season and was considered past his best. Gatlin had ran the fastest times that year and was considered a real threat to Bolt's dominance of the event. The final arrived and Gatlin flew out of the blocks and was ahead going into the last 25 metres of the race. But he lost focus. And as they neared the finish line, he glanced across to see where Bolt was. And in that instance, he lost the race. In our Christian walk, our coach, Jesus Christ, is telling us to focus on him and nothing else. Friends, as you run the race of life, let me warn you of three things not to focus on. First, look unto Jesus, not to circumstances. Circumstances change from good to bad in a heartbeat, but Jesus never changes, and he is always good. Second, look unto Jesus, not to other Christians. Sometimes we expect of others what we do not expect of ourselves, perfection, or at least near perfection. Everyone in this sanctuary this morning is human and will let you down if you get to know them long enough. Don't set your eyes on one another and one another's faults and failures and shortcomings and weaknesses. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you are visiting this morning, you might be really impressed with our little church. By the way, I think we've got a great little church. I've seen very few churches that have the love and desire to serve God and grow like this church has. But I've got bad news for you. We aren't perfect. As a matter of fact, we aren't even close. Get your eyes off people and keep them on Jesus. And lastly, look unto Jesus, not to religious leaders. Preachers are just as prone to fail and let you down as all other mortals. If your eyes are on me, for example, prepare yourself for some big disappointments. So to close this morning, let me ask you three questions. First, have you been holding on to some sin or some weight that's holding you back in following Christ all the way, wholeheartedly, completely, and without reservation? Why not lay that sin or weight down this morning at the altar of confession and dedication? Confess it to God. Resolve to forsake it. Cast it aside. Refuse it any longer in your life and run the race free and unencumbered by those sins and weights. Second, are you putting in the effort, fighting the good fight, not giving up, keeping on, keeping on, refusing to quit. If you thought the Christian life was going to be easy, somebody fooled you. You have the incredible resources of the Spirit of God and the powerful promises and instructions of the Word of God to run the race with success. But it requires personal dedication, commitment, devotion, <laughs> focus, effort, work, sacrifice, discipline, are you willing to pay the price to win the prize? Lastly, do you have your eyes on the coach, Jesus Christ, 
as he leads and cheers you to the finish line. Maybe you were like me, with your eyes on your circumstances, and you lost focus and lost momentum in the race. Maybe your eyes were on a pastor, or a Christian friend, or a Christian mentor, and he or she failed you or sinned, and it tripped you up and you got out of the race. You never should have focused on sorry, fallible, sinful people to begin with. Only Jesus will never fail you and is always good. God says to keep your eyes on Jesus. The Christian walk is a marathon, not a sprint. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for being the greatest cheering section we will ever have. Father, thank you for believing in us even on the days we sound like Moses and question if we have the skills to do our God-sized dream. You keep chanting, you can do this, despite the fears we keep pointing out. Thank you for the reminder that we need to run the race to win the prize. Father, remind us on those hard days that the ultimate prize is living out our lives on this great adventure with you. For you promised to give us life and give it to us abundantly. Thank you, Jesus, for jumping up and down, reminding us that we can finish strong. You keep reminding us that you have given us your strength to finish a race. Thank you for being our living water and water stations throughout the race. Thank you for making our bodies strong enough to endure the obstacles we will face during our race. Thank you for reminding us that we are not running this journey alone. You are running alongside of us, helping us set the pace to win the prize. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our strength coach and giving us training sessions so we can have staying power and tenacity. Holy Spirit, you are an amazing helper who petitions on our behalf even when we are sleeping. Lord, please continue to show us how to run the race so we might win the prize. Thank you in advance for how you will make your promises come true in our lives. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song this morning is one of my favourite Christian songs, There is a Redeemer, written by Melody Green and a song that helped her come to terms with the death of her husband, Keith Green, in a plane crash with these wonderful words. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Let's all stand to sing. <laughs>